And the next item of business is members' business debate on motion 15264 in the name of Richard Lyle on remembering the Holocaust. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put, and I would ask those who wish to speak to press the request to speak buttons. I call on Richard Lyle to open the debate for around seven minutes, please. Thank you, President Officer. Can I firstly say that every party, including the independent member in this parliament, has supported this Holocaust motion today. I wish to thank the vast amount of members who have signed my motion to enable this debate and every member who will speak in this debate this afternoon for their support. It's appreciated. Today we will be commemorating a tragedy of the past, but I believe this topic is completely relevant to the issues we are facing in our world today. President Officer, January 30th, 1933 is a day the world should and will never forget. It is the day Adolf Hitler became Chancellor of Germany. When his very first day in office, he began putting his terrible machinations into work. Eventually, he would have the means to perpetrate the terrible genocide known as the Holocaust. Through various stages of persecution, Jews were oppressed by laws of the countries they lived in, separated from their loved ones, placed in various types of camps and prisons, and millions ultimately killed in horrific and inhumane methods. I grew up reading of their suffering in a publication called Parnell's History of the Second World War, along with other publications which detailed the tragic history they have endured. Perhaps no other people group has survived more hate and violence than the Jewish people. Last year, as a member of the cross-party group Building Bridges with Israel, I, along with other members, visited Yad Vashem, the World Holocaust Remembrance Center, Center set on the slopes of the Mount of Remembrance on the edge of Jerusalem. Yad Vashem is a solemn place with its nine chilling galleries of interactive historical displays which detail the Holocaust using a range of multimedia, including photographs, films, documents, letters, works of art, and personal items found in the camps and ghettos. The museum leads into an eerie space containing over three million names of Holocaust victims. There's also a hall, a hall of remembrance where the ashes of dead are buried. There's an avenue of the righteous among the nations, which has over 2,000 trees which were planted in honour of non-Jews who endangered their lives in order to rescue Jews from the Nazis. Yad Vashem is not a, a, an emotionally easily a, a museum to visit, but it is worth a visit to understand the true scale and impact of the Holocaust. The photographs, the displays and walking in the gardens, especially when we came to a, a railway car which had been used to transport people to their death, was very emotional. I will always remember what I saw in that visit. As yet, I have not visited Auschwitz-Birkenau, but I intend to remedy that as soon as I can. Colleagues, we all know well the atrocities committed during the Second World War, where Nazi Germany executed a calculated plan to exterminate the Jews on a scale one darkest dreams could not imagine. Yet those nightmares became a reality, and six million Jews and countless millions of people died simply because they were deemed inferior or a problem that needed a solution. And to Hitler, that indefensible final solution was death. On January 27, 1945, roughly 12 years uh, since Hitler came to power, Auschwitz-Birkenau was freed by the Allied forces. What the res rescuers saw when entering the concentration and death camp was a horror beyond describing. What goes through someone's minds that forces them to desire to exterminate millions of people who are entirely undeserving? As we look back collectively, we must all ask the same burning question in our hearts. How could this happen? How could someone, something so evil take place in a civilised and modern society? Presiding officer, I certainly want to emphasise the sorrow and grief we all share, and the tremendous loss of life and intense suffering that so many endured. And I do not want to get that forgotten in this speech. But I also want to speak on uh, speaking to humanity as a whole. The Holocaust, more than anything, represents a tragedy that is an enemy of humanity and its struggles. 
On a day such as today, when we mourn the atrocities of Nazi Germany, it is easy to point fingers and cast blame, and deservedly so. But to forget that Hitler was human and the Nazis were people is a mistake none of us can forget to make. To do this would be to lower our guard in a time where there cannot be anything but be constantly vigilant. World War II ended, and to those who were involved in the carrying out of the Holocaust, they all faced justice, be it in this life or the next. Let us not be blinded, for while we achieved victory against Nazi Germany, we had not defeated human evil. Thus, dangerous people still seek to spread death and destruction to this day. Only a few months ago, a tragic synagogue shooting in Philadelphia resulted in the deaths of 11 people. Today, there are countless atrocities being committed against a multitude of people, groups, persecution, torture, displacement, and murder of oppressed peoples, groups that still sadly are occurring in places around the world. Such subsequent genocides have taken place in Cambodia, Rwanda, Bosnia, and Darfur. Persecution and discrimination have no place in our, our communities because they defy everything a free and democratic society stands for. We have the power to live in a productive and moral life and oppose those who choose to do the opposite. We have the power to charitably give to those in need across the world. We must stand together and say welcome to those who are discriminated against and persecuted. We should learn to live with each other in peace. What a happy day that would be. As members of this parliament, we cannot stand idly by and watch the vulnerable suffer. We all must recognise that it does not matter what religion we follow, what country we live in, where our parents were born, or what language we speak. A crime against humanity affects us all. Unity amongst the human race for common decency and respect is a necessity in all our modern era. President officer, I want to again thank all those who will speak today. Their words will mean a lot to many. I want to reiterate that we all must recognise that we have the power to choose how we live and how we respond to other lifestyles and decisions. On a day like today, we can clearly see the mistakes made by so many resulted in millions of, of lives lost. The past can sometimes be a place of regret and sorrow, but it can be a teacher unlike any other. Witnessing the failures and triumphs of those in the past works is a fantastic guidebook to, those, to, to us in how we live our lives. Today is meant to honour those who suffered and died from the Holocaust, and, commend, and I commend all those who fought to end the Holocaust. We must continue to combat anti-Semitism and discrimination in all its forms in general on each and every occasion. Thank you, President Officer. We move now to the open debate. Can I say to members that there's a lot of people who wish to speak, so I would ask you not to go beyond the, the four-minute um, normal slot. And I call Adam Tompkins to be followed by Tom Arthur. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'd like to thank uh, Richard Lyle for um, bringing this uh, debate to the Chamber. I'd also like to thank uh, Kezia Dugdale for hosting the uh, beautiful and moving uh, memorial to the uh, Holocaust that was in the Garden Lobby earlier this week. Presiding officer, with the absurd precision to which we later had to accustom ourselves, the Germans held the roll call. At the end, the officer asked, wie viel Stuck? The corporal saluted smartly and replied that there were 650 pieces and that all was in order. They then loaded us onto the buses and took us to the station. Here the train was waiting for us. Here we received our first blows. And it was so new and senseless that we felt no pain neither in body nor spirit, only a profound amazement. How can one hit a man without anger? There were 12 goods wagons for 650 men. In mine, we were only 45, but it was a small wagon. Here then, before our very eyes, under our very feet, was one of those notorious transport trains, those which never return, and of which, shuddering and always a little incredulous, we had so often heard speak exactly like this detail for detail, goods wagons closed from the outside with men, women, and children pressed together without pity like cheap merchandise for a journey towards nothing, a journey down there, a journey towards the bottom. This time, it is us who are inside. 
These words are from the opening chapter of Primo Levi's autobiographical account of the Holocaust, If This Is a Man. And in the middle of this passage, Primo Levi asks a hauntingly simple question. How can one hit a man without anger? As I said in last year's Holocaust Memorial debate, the Holocaust happened because not very long ago, here in the heart of Europe, it was the policy of the government of a leading European country to eliminate the Jewish people from the face of the earth. Yet the Nazis were not angry with the Jews. The brutality, the beatings, the mass murder, the killing on an industrial scale did not happen because anyone had cause to be angry. They happened because of cold, calculated hatred. And every year, reflecting on the Holocaust and its legacy, I find myself coming back to the same phrases, even to the same basic thoughts. On the one hand, the Holocaust was unique. Yes, there have been other genocides, but there has been only one Holocaust, only one program of systematic death so comprehensive in scale, so audacious in its evil ambition that a whole new country had to be found to give a dispersed and fractured people a home. But on the other hand, what strikes you about the Holocaust is also what Hannah Arendt infamously called its banality. They were just trains, just ordinary goods wagons with the goods counted on and counted off, taken on a journey. To think of it, one shudders, yet is always a little incredulous. And this is what hatred can do. Hatred does not create monsters. Monsters are extraordinary. They instantly stand out from the crowd. You can see them a mile off, and they are very rare. What hatred does is not to create monsters, but to allow ordinary men and women to commit terrible acts as if they were the most mundane quotidian of tasks, just loading goods onto a train. Arendt coined her notorious phrase, the banality of evil, in her report for The New Yorker of Eichmann's trial. The great Canadian singer-songwriter Leonard Cohen captured her meaning in his poem, All There Is To Know About Adolf Eichmann. And I'm going to read it, it's very short. All There Is To Know About Adolf Eichmann. Eyes, medium. Hair, medium. Weight, medium. Height, medium. Distinguishing features, none. Number of fingers, 10. Number of toes, 10. Intelligence, medium. What did you expect? Talons, oversized incisors, green saliva, madness. The Holocaust was not mad, presiding officer. It was calculated. It was committed not in a frenzy of anger and emotion, but in a climate of cold-headed hatred. Now, there is plenty of room in politics for emotion, for frenzy, even for anger, but not for hatred. Yes, we here disagree on many matters, and those disagreements may make us angry from time to time, but let there be no room here or anywhere else in political life for hatred, and let that, for us, be the lesson of the Holocaust. Tom Arthur, followed by Alex Rowley. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. I would like to begin by thanking my colleague, Richard Lyle, for securing this debate and thanking him for what was an excellent speech. I also want to uh, put on record my deep appreciation for the remarks that um, Adam Tompkins made, which I thought was an absolutely superb speech, one of the finest I have heard since being elected to this place. I, I think that the points that have been touched on by both Richard Lyle and Adam Tompkins get to that central question that we still ask ourselves is how? How could this happen? And I think that the diagnosis made by Hannah Arendt in the early 1960s as she covered the Aikman trial <laughs> effectively summarised by Leonard Cohen in his poem remains the most pertinent, the banality the quote from Primo Levi, wie uh, viel Stück, that word Stück, peace. Hatred perhaps is not positive, but an absence of empathy. I think one of the most chilling facts of the Holocaust 
I find, is the decision to use carbon monoxide and Zyklon B gas in the extermination. In the early phase of the killings in the occupied territories of the East as the Wehrmacht advanced SS Einsatzgruppens would follow up behind special commands and they would kill shooting massacres like Babi Yar in Ukraine. But it was determined that using gas would be more humane, not for the victims, but for the perpetrators. And this, of course, became possible. It was a, a methodology that was seized upon because preceding the systematic attempt to eliminate the Jewish population of Europe, the German government had been using gas, carbon monoxide, to eliminate the disabled and the infirm. And a point at which Lyle made at the very start of his speech is with regards to when did this start, 30th of January. I'm currently reading one of the, I think, great pieces of literature to emerge from the Holocaust, and that's the diaries of Victor Klemperer, who was a professor of philology and Romance languages in Dresden, and he meticulously noted amongst observations in his own life and many of the prosaic goings on that characterized any life of any middle-class German professor, the slow stranglehold and asphyxiation of liberty and civil rights and status that took place, the marginalization. And while we rightly focus our attention on the events towards the end in the extermination camps, and that is rightfully what is preeminent in our memories. There was a process of psychological torture that preceded that. It's a difficult thing, I think, for anyone to try and contemplate what that must have been like to say that I am a German, and to be told, no, you're not. And that lesson that we have spoken about so far of hate and of allowing hate to be tolerated or to be acceptable or to be seen as something that can be permitted in moderation is a great folly. Because, as both Richard Lyle and Adam Tompkins have said, it, the greatest mistake we can make is to look upon Nazis and the crimes they committed as the acts of monsters. They were cool, clinical, and rational. And I think that perhaps the most chilling, chilling story I have, very difficult, I think the most chilling example of how this was captured was during the extermination of the Hungarian Jews. They were, oper they were carrying out these murders at such a scale that the crematoria at Auschwitz could not cope. So cremation pits were dug. And the testimony of a surviving Sonder commando, the Jews who were forced to work in the gas chambers in the crematorium. They were two Hungarian sisters and their friend. And they knew what was going to happen. And they said to an SS guard, I would like it if we could die together so can you shoot us together? And the SS guard lined the three of them up, laughing and chuckling and saying he would be happy to oblige. And he shot, and the bullet went through one, two, and the three of them collapsed. And their bodies were then thrown into a cremation pit. And the screaming began because one of them hadn't been shot. And the SS guards laughed thought this was hilarious. So I think to know that that happened within living memory in one of the most advanced civilizations in the world is a lesson for us all. That is what human beings are capable of. This was not some aberration. This was an end of a, a very cold, clinical, and for them, logical process. So we must remember that. And I agree entirely with Adam Tompkins. Whatever differences we have in this place, whatever differences we have politically, anger, yes, passion, yes, but never, ever hate. Now, Alex Rowley, followed by Gillian Martin. Presiding officer, um, 
I would also I thank Richard Lyle for bringing this motion forward today. I certainly learned from a very early age about what had happened uh, to the Jews during the Second World War. I did so because my mum uh, regularly talked about the Second World War and what happened. What she was never able to explain to me was how a group of human beings could murder on an industrial scale uh, other human beings. And I don't think that's ever been explained. But when I was in Auschwitz last, last uh, Easter, the guide, who was excellent and, 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 and quite chilling, it was a chilling visit that, that I think remains in my memory every day, but I asked her, how could this happen? And it was something, the thing that Tom Arthur said earlier about how hate, anti-Semitism, racism, false news can start to spread and people start to believe it. And that's why it is right and proper that we always call out hate, racism, uh, anti-Semitism, wherever it exists, and that we call out fake news. Um, the, other, the other point that that guide made to me that day, and I think it is important, was she said to me that when Hitler came to power, he initially wanted to expel many of the Jews from Germany. And the problem that they ran into was that as refugees, other countries would not take them. And I'm reminded of that by a story of the MS St. Louis, which was a German ocean liner that set off in 1939 with more than 900 Jews on board. It tried to dock in Cuba. It then tried to go dock in America. It then tried to dock in Canada. And none of those nations would allow those refugees to go into their country. And historians estimate that approximately a quarter of the, those, those people died in extermination camps once they had gone back into Europe. An important point about this debate in Holocaust Remembrance Day is surely that we learn from history. Not only could how such an awful, terrible thing happen for human beings to other human beings, but we learn from that. And that's why the theme of this year's uh, Holocaust Memorial Day, Torn From Your Home. You know, there are 50 million people, it's estimated, displaced across the world. We see people fleeing violence, horrendous violence, and the threat of death from Syria. And yet, they find it difficult for countries to take them in. So while we condemn the Holocaust, we need to remember that today, as, as, as Richard Lyell said, Cambodia, Rwanda, Bosnia, Darfur, but it's happening today across the world. And let's then not forget the countries that are so poverty stricken that people that are starving to death are not able to flee, such as Yemen. So it's important that, that, that yes, we remember the horrors so that they can never happen again. But sadly, many of these things continue to happen. And it's important, therefore, that we uh, address that. When I was in um, Krakow uh, and did a tour of Krakow, the guide took me to the Jewish quarter and people, Jewish people, uh, had been moved out in their tens of thousands into a ghetto. Most of them ended up in the extermination camps and died. But nobody was standing up for them. Why did that happen? So I think those lessons are there, but anyone that thinks that today we don't have these threats needs to think again. Let's remember the lessons. And I would conclude by, I think, congratulating the Scottish Government, local government, because our schools across Scotland, they are at the fore of ensuring that young people learn about exactly what did happen in the Second World War. And hopefully, education is the way that we will try and address any of this happening in the future. Uh, before I call Gillian Martin, there are still a number of members who wish to speak in the debate. 
So I'm happy to accept a motion under Rule 8.14.3 that the debate be extended by up to 30 minutes. And I would invite Richard Lyle to move the motion. So moved, President Officer. The question is that under Rule 8.14.3, the debate to be extended by up to 30 minutes. Are we agreed? That is therefore agreed. Uh, can I also say that um, I understand that there's so much to say in this debate and I have been generous so far with timings. I'm starting to get a bit concerned but, uh, that we'll overrun and I'll have to cut someone out and I really don't want to do that. So could I ask the remaining speakers please to be mindful of time? Thank you. Gillian Martin followed by Ross Greer. Thank you, President Officer, and thank you to Richard Lyle for securing this debate, a very important debate, in the midst of inconceivable horror, when you could lose your faith in humanity as you listen to the terrible accounts of human beings behaving in what is often described as inhuman ways, heroes and examples of the best in humanity can emerge. This Tuesday in the garden lobby, along with many others here, I sat tra transfixed as I listened to the account of Holocaust survivor Jean Weber. That's the first time to my knowledge that I have been in the same room with someone who survived the Holocaust. Janine's now in her 80s and is only still with us because of the kind of brave people who risked their own lives to help the young Jewish girl in Poland that she was then. She's here because of the love that trumped hatred. And I want to use the rest of my time to talk about the story of another person who exhibited the best of humanity when all around um, him were, uh, um, were, 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 were cont contemplating and, and, and um, making atrocities. Um. His name was Dr. Janusz Korszak. Korszak was a paediatrician, journalist and children's author, but after serving as a military doctor, he decided that the best use of his time was as an educator of children. And along with his fellow educator, Steva Vilsinska, he founded his own orphanage for Jewish children called Dom Serot in Warsaw. He was an educational pioneer whose type of philosophy of teaching was decades ahead of his own time, focused on making children independent, confident, learning outdoors, learning through discussion and dialogue, and never by rote. He gave these children a chance to thrive. And his orphanage even had its own children's parliament where the children were empowered to make decisions, did their own newspaper where they could express their own views and had their own court where they could exhibit and learn the values of justice and taking responsibility. And then, as we know only too well, the Nazis came to Poland and his work became about the protection and the survival of these children. The number of children he took in at the orphanage increased as children lost their parents at the hands of the Nazis. In 1940, as Warsaw Jews were forced into the ghetto, Korczak's orphanage moved there too. Korczak went with his children, despite repeatedly being offered by the Nazis to stay on what they called the Aryan side. On the 5th of August 1942, he and Stefa and the 12 remaining orphanage staff boarded the train with their 200 children to Treblinka. And we all know no one ever came back from Treblinka. Korczak was with his children to the end, comforting them and protecting them until he couldn't. And I'd encourage everyone to seek out the film Korczak, directed by the incredible Polish director Andrzej Wajda, because there's so much to the story that I don't have time to tell here. Alongside the accounts of the horrors and hatred that we must always tell forever as a warning from history, and particularly want to pay tribute to what Alec Rowley has just said about it being a warning. And um, we have a responsibility to never, ever turn anyone away who needs our help. There are the Janusz Korczaks and the Stefa Wyszynskas, whose stories of courage and love we must also never forget. The stories told by Janine Weber of her aunt who saved her life and the, the, the Pole who, who harboured 14 Jews in Warsaw um, when all around them were being put into wagons taken to Treblinka. Alongside those horrors, there are stories of love we must never forget. In the midst of hatred, the stories of love shine through. Thank you, President Officer. Ross Greer, followed by Annabel Ewing. 
Thank you, Presiding Officer. Like colleagues, I'm grateful for this annual opportunity to mark Holocaust Memorial Day in Parliament, and I'm grateful to Richard Lyle for having ensured that that happened again this year. In the years since we last held this debate, we've seen yet more events which really throw into question whether Europe and the wider world has learned from history's worst atrocity. Anti-Semitism may be a more visible issue today than it was a few years ago, but that's not because it's being rooted out. Whether it's the actions of governments like those in Hungary and Poland or individuals and hate groups, including those here in the UK and in Scotland, we cannot underestimate the very real threat that hatred still poses to all of us, but which disproportionately threatens already oppressed communities like our Jewish friends and family. The Ferret Scotland's Investigation Collective has in the last week found an extremist, anti-Semitic and fascist organisation plans to infiltrate our community councils. This is a group modelled on Oswald Mosley's pro-Nazi fascist organisation from a few decades ago. MI5 have now taken on the role of leading the fight against extremist far-right groups here in the UK because the threat that they pose has grown significantly in a short space of time. Many of these groups, many of these individuals might appear ridiculous, they might appear utterly marginalised, but they are only marginalised until they are not exactly as the Nazis were, from a very short space of time going from the kind of political party that could barely muster 1% of the vote to having taken absolute control of their country. We should not for a second treat Holocaust Memorial Day as an opportunity only to remember. It is an opportunity to remind ourselves of the horrors allowed to happen on our continent within living memory and to recommit ourselves to stopping them from ever happening again. Following on from Gillian Martin's comments, I've also, like I'm sure a number of members here had, had the privilege of meeting and talking to survivors of the Holocaust. And I was acutely aware that there will be very few people in the future who will be able to say that. We are some of the last generations who will be able to say that within living memory, we have been able to connect with those who survived that atrocity. But I'd like to focus on, on one particular anniversary this afternoon. In the year since our last uh, Holocaust Memorial event, the world marked all too quietly, I believe, the 75th anniversary of the Warsaw Ghetto uprising. By the spring of 1943, some 400,000 Jewish Warsaw residents had been forced into a ghetto of three and a half square kilometers. That was 30% of the city's population forced into two and a half percent of its area without nearly enough food, without, uh, with thousands of people dying from starvation, over seven people to every room. From October 1941, the occupying Germans issued a decree that any Jew caught outside the ghetto should be executed. Around that time, stories of the mass execution of Jews by the Nazis and their collaborators had reached the ghetto, and a number of young people began to organize for its defense. From the summer of 1942, the Nazis started the extermination of Warsaw's Jews. Every day, 6,000 people were to be sent to the extermination camps. The first group were sent to die on the 22nd of July, 1942, the eve of the Jewish holiday of Tisha B'Av, the saddest day in Jewish history. By mid-September, 300,000 of the ghetto's 400,000 residents had been murdered. In that same month, the Jewish resistance did manage to secure a small amount of arms and explosives from the Polish Home Army, supplemented by their own homemade grenades. But like many Jewish resistance groups across the continent, they were not supported by other anti-Nazi resistance groups. The eternal shame of most of Europe's resistance movements, their own anti-Semitism, cost the lives of many Jews. In January of 1943, the Nazis resumed the liquidation of the ghetto and the resistance started. The first action was to attack German troops, moving a group of Jews to the extermination camps. Most of the dozen fighters involved died, but many of those set to be murdered in Treblinka were able to escape. The commander of this operation and the overall leader of the uprising was 24-year-old Mordecai uh, Anilevitz. Uh, Anilevitz's uh, resistance uh, leadership then began preparing for the inevitable all-out assault on the ghetto. The, thousands of the thousand fighters of the ghetto, men, women and children, had no expectation that they would win. They were entirely surrounded, they had limited weapons and equipment, and there was no prospect of rescue. Their resistance was, in their own words, for the honour of the Jewish people, to inspire Jews across occupied Europe to resist and to protest the world's silence at their extermination. Their uprising began on the 19th of April 1943, when 850 Nazi soldiers in a tank entered the ghetto to burn it down block by block. They were driven back by the Jewish fighters. In a symbolic moment, stories of which spread across Europe, two boys raised Polish and Jewish flags from the roof of a building, causing Himmler to bellow at his Warsaw commander that he must bring them down. Rather than fight the entrenched and fearless defenders, the Nazis instead used artillery, flamethrowers and poison gas to burn them out. 
and Iluitz and his commanders uh, died in their bunker with some 300 others. Resistance lasted for weeks, with fighters disappearing and reappearing from the sewers in their tunnel network. Eventually, the ghetto was levelled. A small number of fighters and civilians made it out to continue the resistance. A handful of them are still alive today. In total, some 400,000 ghetto residents were murdered by May 1943. But those thousand fighters, largely young people and led by someone the same age I am today, made the Nazis pay for what they were trying to do. Their story is one many have nothing more than passing knowledge of. Many more have never heard of it at all. It was a story of people in the most desperate circumstances who, facing their certain deaths, chose to resist the evil surrounding them until their final moments. I think it's a story worth remembering. Annabel Hewitt, followed by Oliver Mundell. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and I'm very pleased indeed to have been called to speak in this year's debate to mark Holocaust Memorial Day. And I also would congratulate my colleague Richard Lyle on securing the debate and the importance that uh, MSPs across this chamber place on it is evident from the number of members seeking to make their contribution today. On this, the 74th anniversary of the liberation of Auschwitz, Birkenau, it is vital that we continue to bear witness to the six million Jews who were murdered by the Nazis. We must do so not only in the memory of those who were murdered, but we must do so to ensure that we are always vigilant and that such state-sanctioned, clinical, calculated mass extermination never ever happens again. Sadly, the world has seen genocide since the end of the Second World War, but our efforts to promote mutual respect and understanding must not falter. Rather, our efforts must be redoubled. Presiding officer, I too uh, have visited Auschwitz. My visit was in the summer of 1982 when I was a young postgraduate student studying international relations at the Johns Hopkins University's Bologna Center. The center had at that time an exchange program with the Jagiellonian University in Krakow. And as part of our visit to Krakow, we had the opportunity to visit, visit Auschwitz. And I remember my visit as if it uh, were yesterday. Uh, and like other members have said, uh, I, I, the, the memories are just impinged upon you, including walking up to the gates of what had been a labor camp at Auschwitz, which of course beckoned people with the words, Arbeit macht frei. I remember too the smiling faces of the young twins in photographs that covered an entire wall, photographs that broke your heart, and that were taken before the grotesque experiments of the butcher Joseph Mengele. I remember the shoes, and I remember the industrial scale ovens in Birkenau. And I also remember the train tracks that came right into the death camp. And I remember asking myself how it was possible the ordinary people like you and me, presiding officer, could be in Paris or Amsterdam one day and then be taken like cattle on trains from the centre of those grand, civilised European cities to end up in Auschwitz-Birkenau. And I also remember asking myself, presiding officer, how it could be that Europe had descended into such obscenity. But in the midst of such obscenities, as we've heard, there were many heroes and one such heroine I would like to pay tribute to today is Irina Sendler. Irina Sendler was a Polish social worker aged only 29 years of age who had a permit allowing her access to the Warsaw Ghetto. What she saw there led her to smuggle into the ghetto food, medicine and supplies and to smuggle out of the ghetto children. In fact, over some four years, Irina Sendler saved 2,500 children. I repeat, presiding officer, 2,000 500 children were saved by this woman, Irina Sender. She was finally caught in 1943 by the Gestapo, and though she was brutally tortured, she did not give up the whereabouts of one single child. Irina Sender was sentenced to death, but in fact, miraculously managed to escape. She said later of that time, and I quote, heroes do extraordinary things. What I did was not an extraordinary thing. It was normal. Presiding officer, how the world could have done with many more Irina Senders, for she was indeed a real heroine and did do exceptionally extraordinary things. I bear witness. Thank you, presiding officer. Oliver Mundell, followed by Emma Harper. Thank you, presiding officer. It's a privilege to take part in today's Holocaust Memorial debate, and I join other members in thanking Richard Lyle for bringing forward uh, this motion. Uh, there's already been some exceptional speeches uh, this afternoon and um, I found myself 
uh, today approaching this debate extremely difficult in terms of deciding what to say. Because there is, of course, a whole lot that can be said, but equally, there's also, uh, in some senses, not a lot to say. And I'm very conscious um, when speaking uh, on this topic of, of a deafening silence, a silence of millions of voices and souls, millions upon millions of voices and souls uh, who are not here uh, to tell us uh, their story, uh, who are not here um, and uh, their offspring are not here uh, to contribute uh, to our society, to our, to our global world. And I think it, in that context, it's so hard to understand the hatred in the minds of others. But we never can forget the cost of division, uh, discrimination, and ultimately the attempted annihilation of a whole people, their culture, their values, and of course, uh, those individual lives. Most of all, uh, it is a reminder that we cannot let our common humanity uh, be challenged or divided because it is indivisible. And despite living in a fractious world that all too often focuses on the narrowness of difference, we are all human beings of equal worth and value. And it is incumbent upon each and every one of us to do what we can to make the world a better place and to make room for others. I remember particularly this year, George Brady, uh, the brother of Hannah Brady himself, a Holocaust uh, survivor, um, who I still feel exceptionally lucky and privileged to have met here in Edinburgh at the International Film Festival uh, during a showing of Inside Hannah's Suitcase, um, a film which I would thoroughly recommend to other members and anyone who wants to understand both the tragic and at times the very random nature of Nazi death camps. I still remember how remarkable George was, uh, speaking uh, with a very philosophical view of life and a great appreciation of the time he'd had with his own family. But I also remember too his real anger and his struggle to comprehend what had happened to his sister and his parents and the complete disconnect he felt with his early life. But in that anger, what was perhaps most surprising was that there was no bitterness no hatred, instead a real determination to ensure that life was valued, respected and cherished and above all else to ensure that that message was passed on to the next generation and to ensure that the memories of those lost live on in our hearts and minds. George died on the 11th of this month and it is a sad loss uh, to the survivor community and again another reminder to all of us uh, of the passage of time. Uh, but as other speakers have said, rather than making these debates um, and the commemorations at less important, uh, the loss of those who bore first-hand witness to the horrors of the Holocaust makes it all the more important. It is our solemn duty uh, to remember, and I'm pleased uh, that as a parliament uh, and as a country, uh, we continue to do so. Presiding officer, I just want to close uh, by highlighting a point that a Jewish friend of mine who teaches in London often makes to the five-year-olds in her class. And I think it's important uh, because to me, it gets right to the heart of these issues. She always says that discrimination, intolerance, bullying and anti-Semitism always start with one. If we remember that fact and ensure that we are not the one who starts such behavior and targets another, and importantly, we ensure we are not the one who stands by and allows such behaviour to go unchallenged, then we can each play our part in making sure that these terrible acts do not happen on our watch. Together, we have a huge responsibility and together we must ensure the world we want to see. Thank you. Emma Harper, followed by Polly McNeill. Thank you, President Officer. I'd like to thank Richard Lyle for bringing this important debate to Chamber and commend all of the powerful contributions that we've heard so far. January the 27th is Holocaust Memorial Day and as the motion states, this provides us an important opportunity to reflect on the tragedy of the Holocaust and the atrocities committed. I think it's extremely important that young people have the opportunity to visit the sites of the concentration camps and to experience for themselves what for me was reflected only in history books at school. 
and I recognise the work of the Holocaust Educational Trust for the continued commitment to support the education of our young people. Last year, I heard directly from two students attending Maxwellton High School located in Lochside in Dumfries and their profound memory invoking experience when they visited Auschwitz-Birkenau. My own nephew is preparing for his school trip as well and uh, him and I will be having a wee discussion about what he thinks he will uh, expect to see. And having these conversations with these young folks made me remember when I lived and worked in Los Angeles, I visited the Museum of Tolerance. It's a multimedia museum which is designed to examine racism and prejudice around the world with a specific focus on the history of the Holocaust. It's a thought-provoking place visited by residents, students and tourists alike. And when I check the visitor numbers to the Museum of Tolerance ahead of this debate, the numbers attending are in the millions. The message that, te that is being taught is against hate, as Adam Tompkins and Tom Arthur power powerfully highlighted. I'd like to share with members an experienced presiding officer which directly brought home to me the physical connection of the Holocaust. And as a recent arrival as an economic migrant in Los Angeles, I was in the operating room one day about to assist the surgeon to take the gallbladder out of a 76-year-old patient. And this woman was of German origin and she'd been a resident of LA for 50 years. She was very frightened about her surgery and being put under anesthesia. So I reassured her that we would look after her and keep her safe. And I held onto her hand. And when I held onto her hand, I looked down at her. Her outstretched forearm was on the surgical arm board. And I noticed a pale grey set of numbers, scrived, written on her forearm. 162753. Now I don't know if I'm remembering the exact numbers, but I definitely remember how those numbers made me feel. Shock, anger, compassion, still today. And all at once, a quick flood of emotions. So what turned and burned in my memory is a pale grey tattoo. The significance of those numbers and the rush of emotions that overwhelmed me. I was 26 years old looking after this lady and she was 26 when she was a survivor. And she was there. And so the, the forced um, numbers on her pale skin, it made a permanent lifelong mark um, rudely on her forearm. And more importantly, she was a survivor and she survived the horrors and nightmares of Auschwitz. That insensitive and human imprint on this woman has been part of my memory for 25 years. The visits taken place by the Waynes and my memories of this particular survivor has contributed to my continued caring for others across this planet who are victims of oppression. Tolerance is needed. Presiding officer, tolerance and respect and are that. And as we recite and remember the words of Robert Burns, tomorrow, two days ahead of Holocaust Remembrance Day, we need to remember that to man and to, that man to man the world over should brothers and sisters be for all that. Thank you. Pauline McNeill, followed by Stuart McMillan. I'd like to thank Richard Lyle for our striking speech and my colleagues Adam Tompkins, Tom Arthur and Emma Harper, we've just heard from her exceptionally striking speech I don't really have anything particularly new to say that perhaps has not been covered, but I would like to say it. It is to my shame that it has taken me to the stage of my life before I visited Auschwitz-Birkenau in Poland. And I did that on the very last day of 2018. I've read what most people have read about the Holocaust and the death camps, but it doesn't, as we've heard from others, Annabel Ewing, Alec Rowley, it doesn't prepare you for how you feel when you see the sheer scale of what you see Auschwitz. When you arrive, the guide will ask you not to take photographs in certain areas. And that, those areas are the, the personal effects of those who perished, where you see their heaps of shoes and cases and their personal belongings, because it's a very sharp and pointed message that women, children and men, each are individuals with an individual story of how they got to this dreadful place. Accounts from brave survivors who escaped to tell the world and their stories are everything to us 
as without them we could not begin to get our heads around the horror of it all. How it could happen at all is the imperative question for any person interested in truly ensuring that it could never happen again. And that is why the Holocaust Memorial Trust is such a vital organisation, because it's not simply to remind us of the six million Jews who were murdered so brutally, but how it could have been allowed to happen in the first place. The world will mark the day, the anniversary of the liberation of Auschwitz Nazi death camp, where well over one million were murdered. The Holocaust, undoubtedly the world's darkest moment, began in 1941 and lasted to 1945. A mass genocide motivated by anti-Semitism, the demonization of a race, pure and unadulterated evil. The Holocaust is a human story perpetrated by human beings. Human beings tolerated this. It is the worst of mankind. There were around six million Jews murdered in the Holocaust, about a third of the Jewish population in the world. Um, but there are also other victims of the Holocaust too. The Roma, ethnic Serbs, Poles and gay people are amongst those who were murdered. But it's clear that even democracy itself is not enough to prevent those kinds of evils if it is not resisted and people do not question what they hear, are allowing their minds to be swayed by demonisation, pre prejudice and hatred of others. Sometimes the sin of doing nothing is the deadliest of all. John Stuart Mill, a British philosopher and political theorist, said, let not anyone pacify his conscience by the delusion that he can do no harm if he takes no part and forms no opinions. Bad men need nothing more to compass their ends than good men should look on and do nothing. But this theme is, uh, of the Holocaust Memorial Trust is torn from home and I think it's so appropriate in 2019. Conflict in the world in some areas is man-made. Rwanda, in a period of just over three months from April 1994, recorded that 800,000 people were brutally slaughtered by fellow citizens. It was former US President Bill Clinton who has called Rwanda one of the greatest regrets during his presidency. He believes that had the US had intervened earlier, around 300,000 people might have been saved. It is particularly alarming to see the new political trends sweeping through Europe, the rise of the far right and the populist right parties. We must consider the impact on people that are torn from their homes, that their way of life because of conflict is unimaginable to us who have not been through it, but we should consider it for one minute. And I think this parliament would all agree that refugees are welcome here. Presiding officer, we must as politicians remember the Holocaust. We must do our duty to speak up against injustice, evil, racism and anti-Semitism, wherever it arises. And to hope that never again will mankind allow the conditions to prevail for any peoples to endure this fate. May the memories of the Jewish survivors bless us to remember and do all we can to ensure that this will never ever happen in the world again. The last of the open debate contributions is from Stuart McMillan. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Presiding Officer, first of all, I want to congratulate my colleague Richard Lyle for securing this uh, important and also annual debate. I also want to thank the Holocaust Memorial Day Trust uh, for their extremely powerful and thought-provoking event in Parliament on Tuesday evening. I know colleagues have already referred to the event. Listening to Janine Weber uh, was a privilege, but also a, a stark reminder of man's inhumanity to man, women, and also children. This annual debate is one that's absolutely necessary. And I've spoken in a few of them in the past, uh, but I didn't do it last year, but I wanted to add my voice to it again uh, this year. The colleagues from across the chamber have already spoken so eloquently and powerfully about how important this debate actually is and, uh, and their various experiences. Uh, I visited Auschwitz in 1999 when I was uh, doing an interrail trip around Europe. Walking in under the Arbeit macht Freigates was daunting, but the, the, the thing that really kind of struck me was the, as I walked in, I was only in about a second or two seconds, and the first language that I heard was German. It was German school children visiting. Now, I was slightly unnerved for, a, for an instant, but then I realized that that was the right thing to see and also to hear. Uh, to 
that the issue of education is so important to really learn those lessons from the past. Now, at the event on Tuesday evening, the, the, the HMD event, uh, when you look at the website, uh, the HMD's website, they've got the, the phraseology of learning from genocide for a better future. Now, it's such a, a simple message, but also so important. <coughs> when uh, I mentioned about the Janine uh, Weber uh, a few moments ago, and uh, genuinely, uh, Janine Weber was uh, such a, uh, an inspiration in terms of uh, her love uh, for, uh, for life, uh, but also her thanks to the people who helped her in the past. But it was also very, very telling that any time she spoke about her seven-year-old brother, uh, when uh, the, the Nazi guard had came in uh, to where she was staying at the time, and uh, he shot her seven-year-old brother, but left her to live. Uh, and you could tell any time she spoke about her brother, it's, uh, she will never, ever go over that. Um, <coughs> the... Also on Tuesday evening, uh, we heard from the, the very reverend uh, Dr. Lorna Hood from the uh, Remembering Srebrenica, Scotland. And uh, Dr. Hood uh, reminded everyone of the quote from the American philosopher, George San Santayana, sorry, Santayana. And, and that was, those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. We've already heard today from colleagues uh, about the uh, about the uh, about what they've heard and about the people that they've spoken to and uh, and the aspect of what's going on in society today uh, in terms of the people who are seeking asylum people who are refugees who are fleeing persecution who are trying to get a better life and we have to stand up to help as a society uh, as a country uh, we have to be prepared to actually help those who need that help. Now, presenting also political developments across the world certainly indicate that there is that growing sense in many countries to, to blame the outsider for the issues that are taking place. And it's not a new notion, uh, but unfortunately that history has repeated itself time and time again, only with that different outsider. In the past, in Scotland, it would have been Irish Catholics or Italians. Now people are blaming others because or their skin colour is different, or they're fleeing somewhere to get that better life here. Now, Scots have actually done the very same thing for centuries. Scots have left to go and get that better life somewhere else. Uh, I will close, presenting also because uh, I'm conscious of time, but um, I, I was privileged uh, to listen to two of my constituents, Megan Quinn and Rhys Lambert, to deliver, who delivered the time for reflection on the 12th of June last year. That was the date of Anne Frank's birthday. They were part, uh, they, they are uh, students at St. Columbus High School in Gurick, uh, and they were doing a project with the Anne Frank Trust. Now, working with that trust has actually shown the de their dedication, but also the dedication of the school to learn uh, and also to teach others about the absolute misery uh, and that man's inhumanity to man that the Holocaust actually delivered. Thank you. And I now ask Aileen Campbell to respond to the debate. For, well, just like everyone else, take as long as you would like. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. And like others uh, across uh, the Chamber this afternoon, I want to thank uh, Richard Lyle for tabling this motion, speaking so movingly about uh, to the motion and for highlighting the significance of Holocaust Memorial Day. It has been, I think everyone would agree, a really powerful, moving and emotional debate and I thank all who have contributed. And regardless of whether you don't think you had something different to offer, I think everybody's voices have uh, added and contributed hugely and immensely uh, to this uh, debate. The International Holocaust Memorial Day provides a really important moment for us all to gather and to collectively reflect upon the terrible events of the Holocaust and the millions of people who were murdered. It's also an opportunity to remember the courage, the bravery shown by all those who fought for liberty, for freedom and justice, some who sadly paid with their lives. And I particularly want to uh, highlight uh, Annabel Ewing's uh, speech about uh, Irina Sandler, who was clearly a remarkable and inspiring and brave woman. And I'm glad that Annabel had the moment and opportunity to pay tribute to what she did and her legacy. 
We must remember the unspeakable persecution by the Nazis of the Jewish community, as well though as the persecution of gay people, disabled people, and anyone else who was viewed as different. It's also estimated, as others have said, that as many as one million Gypsy and Roma people were also murdered by the Nazi regime. And as others express, we must never forget the horrors of the Holocaust and other genocides around the world, which are a stark reminder of the inhumanity and violence that bigotry and intolerance can cause if it's left unchallenged. And on that, Adam Tompkins is uh, absolutely right, and he powerfully expressed the Holocaust was calculated, it was systematic, and it was motivated by hate. And again, uh, Adam Tompkins, Richard Lyle, Tom uh, Arthur and others were also correct when they said that there is no room here in politics for pa there is room here in politics for passion and for anger, but there must be never any room for hatred. And while we remember and reflect on that, action and leadership is required of us all as politicians to show example in our discourse and our conduct. And I think on all of those issues, we're all united on that. The side light, sadly, the Holocaust and the remembrance that followed has not spelled the end of hatred. This year marks, as others have mentioned, the 25th anniversary of the Rwandan genocide and the 40th anniversary of the end of genocide in Cambodia. Last year marked 25th anniversary of the start of the atrocities in northern Bosnia. And atrocious human rights violations are still happening in the world right now. They're happening in Sudan and Darfur, where millions of people are being forced to flee their homes as they face the threat of violence and persecution. And last year, the dreadful attack at the Tree of Life Synagogue in Pittsburgh saw an ordinary day of worship turn into a day of fear which was felt across the world. Collectively, this debate has uh, coalesced around a strong, united uh, message. Uh, in many ways, it's a simple message uh, that we must not be, though, complacent in the face of discrimination, racism and hatred. And we must take uh, action to tackle hatred and intolerance and promote the positive vision of the society that we aspire to be. And that message of never being complacent, I think, is one was made very strongly by uh, Ross Gear. And that's in part why each year we work in partnership with the Holocaust Memorial, Memorial Day Trust and Interfaith Scotland to deliver Scotland's National Holocaust Memorial Day event. And I have the privilege this year of speaking at the event in East Renfrewshire. And there are a variety of events taking place across Scotland next week, and I hope members take the opportunity to participate. Again, showing that united stance that Scotland has taken across our communities, across local government and the Scottish government, that uh, lessons of the past must guide our future. And like Alec Rowley, I would like to say a little about this year's theme, Torn From Home. Many of us take home for granted. It's our physical place of residence. It's our community or our country. And such places should offer a sense of safety and security that is important to our everyday lives and our sense of well-being. Now, I can't imagine the feeling of uh, if any of those places were to be taken away from me or my family, or if we were forced to leave those places behind, places that we've built our lives around and attached such strong feelings of belonging and connectedness, places that we feel safe in. And as Cabinet Secretary for Communities, I uh, had the privilege to meet with refugees and people seeking asylum and listening to people who have ha had been forced to leave their own homes and their own livelihoods behind, who have been separated from their friends and their family, and have faced the very frightening uncertainty of an unknown future. That unknown future often more appealing than remaining at home and facing the consequences of hate or prejudice. Because the reality is no one chooses to be torn from home, uh, yet despite years of remembrance of the horrors of Holocaust, this remains an experience for far too many around the world, with Alec Rowley reminding us of the 50 million people who are displaced around the world. And while I am proud that Scotland has a long history of welcoming people of all nationalities and faiths, and we are committed to supporting their integration into our communities, it is vital that we continue to send a message that Scotland is a welcoming place for all those who have chosen to make this country their home, and to do so with a vigilance that never permits the creep of complacency. Because although Scotland is an open and inclusive nation, we are not immune from hateful behaviour or prejudicial attitudes. In June 2017, we published an ambitious programme of work to tackle hate crime and build community cohesion, and I chair an action group with key stakeholders to take that work forward. However, one area I want to particularly emphasise is our approach to tackling anti-Semitism. And we know from our regular engagement with Jewish organisations and community leaders that, that Jewish people continue to experience anti-Semitism and discrimination. It was a message I heard at our most recent interfaith summit, one that was, I struggled to listen to 
uh, because of its impact on the Jewish community. And this anti-Semitism is absolutely unacceptable. There is no place in Scotland for any form of anti-Semitism or religious hatred that makes our communities feel insecure or threatened in their daily uh, lives. Scotland's diversity is our strength and we value and appreciate our relationship with our Jewish communities. And that's why we formally adopted the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance definition of anti-Semitism in June 2017. We must never forget what prejudice, including anti-Semitism, can lead to, and therefore why education about tolerance, compassion, and respect is so important. We are committed to providing opportunities for Scotland's children and young people to learn about the Holocaust as part of their education. And it's for that reason that the Scottish Government continues to support the work of the Holocaust Educational Trust and their Lessons from Auschwitz project, which is an incredibly powerful way for young people to gain insight into the horrors of the Holocaust, and just as importantly, to learn about why it happened. Now, to date, over 4,000 Scottish students have participated in the project, as well as over 550 Scottish teachers. Last year, the First Minister visited Auschwitz as part of this programme, along with 89 pupils from a number of Scottish schools. And I have really and truly appreciated the contributions from members who themselves have visited Auschwitz and their moving accounts of what they saw and their experience and how it impacted upon them. And while the living memories and testimonies of the Holocaust survivors fade, it makes it even more crucial for the next and future generations to continue to learn about the Holocaust as part of their education and in order to emerge into their adulthoods as responsible, compassionate citizens of the future. Presiding Officer, the Holocaust Memorial Day in Scotland provides us an opportunity to learn from the past and encourage us to work together to tackle hatred and prejudice so that we can create a stronger, more inclusive future for everyone. Our commitment to promoting and supporting Holocaust Memorial Day demonstrates our collective resolve to stand in solidarity with victims of genocide and other human rights abuses and atrocities around the world. We must keep the memory of such genocides alive and never forget the consequences of bigotry and intolerance. But this is about more than just memory and not forgetting. It's about action, it's about vigilance, and it's about commitment. Commitment to tackle all forms of oppression, hate, and discrimination. Vigilance to never let it go when we hear hate or witness prejudice or uh, tolerate attempts to create an otherness of anyone who may be different. It's about acting to work collectively to create a Scotland where, and a world that is tolerant, kind, compassionate, and celebrates that diversity. Uh, it, and, it's a, uh, and, that, and another world, I believe, is uh, possible, and another world is possible that is free from hatred if we strive to make it happen. But it will take more than reflection, and that's why I am proud that in this parliament this afternoon, regardless of political party, on this we are absolutely united. Because in many parliaments, in many chambers around the world, that is simply not the case. So we should seek to draw power from that, we should seek to draw pride from that, but we should also seek to use that and the messages that come from this parliament, that united message that comes from each and every one of us as elected representatives, that we can use this to change, uh, to make change, to make progress on tolerance and to make sure that that happens, not just in Scotland, but forth of our shores. And that would be one way in which we can make sure that Holocaust memorial and memory doesn't just become something that we remember and reflect upon, but actually we strive to make and create a better future in the here and now and for the future generations ahead. So again, I pay tribute to uh, Richard Lyle and to everybody, each and every member who took part in this debate today for their moving, their powerful uh, uh, articulation of why this continues to be something that we should remember and commemorate in this parliament. So thank you. That uh, concludes a, a very important debate today and um, this meeting is suspended until 2.30. <laughs>